Welcome to Face to Face with Dr. Bruce Gerald. I'm Alex Lakowski, Executive Director of Media Relations. In just over three months, the COVID-19 pandemic has cost the lives of more than 113,000 Americans and the jobs of tens of millions more. It's also closed or derailed public schools, disrupted the work of social service providers, and curtailed the service and hours of operation of public transportation. In urban areas like Baltimore, the impact has been magnified. According to a Pew Research Center study released two weeks ago, that study says the areas hardest hit by COVID-19 deaths generally have higher shares of residents living in urban or densely populated suburban areas, and those residents are much more likely to be non-white. The same inequities can be seen in unemployment, distance learning resources, access to health care, and much more. One policy analyst at the Center for American Progress says, quote, this suggests that communities with more white residents have far greater access to testing, treatment, remote work, private vehicles, single family homes than in communities of color, and that coronavirus is not the great equalizer that many pundits purported it to be. So what can and is being done right here in West Baltimore? And what else can we all do together to protect the lives and well-beings of our greater community? Here to talk about that today are two people who are dedicated to that mission. Bronwyn Maiden is Associate Dean at the University of Maryland School of Social Work and Executive Director of the Promise Heights Initiative. Promise Heights works with schools, community-based organizations, faith-based institutions, and others to improve educational outcomes for youth and ensure that families are healthy and successful in the Upton Druid Heights communities. We're also joined by the Reverend Alvin Hathaway, Senior Pastor of Union Baptist Church in Druid Hill, a powerful voice for change and empowerment in Baltimore, and I should add, a great partner to UMB. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Now, well, We were expecting a third guest, Chris Turk, Principal of James McHenry Elementary Middle School, a UMB partner school in the Hollands Market area. Unfortunately, Mr. Turk was called away just today to a mandatory meeting of all Baltimore public school principals, so we'll have to look forward to speaking with him at a future time. A little later in the program, you, the audience, will have a chance to ask questions or make comments. Please use the chat function to do that. Now, click on the button at the bottom of your screen that looks like a speech bubble. If you're using a cell phone, you might find that icon on the upper right-hand area of the screen. Type your question there and send it to me. When the time comes, we'll call on you by name. I'll unmute your mic for you, so all you have to do is to listen for your name and speak up. Now, one more thing, this program is being recorded, or I should say it'll be about to be recorded when I press the button. It'll be posted on our COVID-19 webpage, umaryland.edu slash coronavirus. With all that out of the way, here's our host, Dr. Bruce Gerald. It's my great pleasure always to participate in these activities. Today, we have two very engaging people that I would call friends who are very active in the community right next to, to uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And I've learned to say that they are part of our community, not next to our community. I've learned a lot over the last couple of months not just about COVID, but also about the impact of COVID on our community, and then about the George Floyd uh, effect on our community. So I hope that we will get into some of those issues today uh, to help me with my understanding. But let's start out first with COVID because all of us have been so immersed in that. So uh, Reverend Hathaway, uh, I know you're close to the people in your community. What are you, what are you hearing about this epidemic and, and what can you tell us about uh, how people are feeling. There's a, you know, I'm, I'm real, uh, real happy to join in this conversation. I have basically three strains of conversations. I can almost group them in three ways. Uh, there are senior members of the community that are basically terrified. Uh, they're in their homes. They are watching the news. Uh, they are afraid to interact, uh, and they find themselves really isolated. And some of the questions become, how do we help break down those barriers of isolation? Uh, there's another group uh, who finds it being an impediment because it impacts their work, it impacts their income. They're wondering how can they survive, how will they be able to make it uh, while, and good now that we're starting to ease up restrictions, but there was a real concern about those whose economic uh, income was severely impacted by this. And then there's a third group, this amazing group. This group uh, uh, almost feels as if they are immune, that it will not affect them. Is nobody that they know in their immediate circles uh, that has gotten it. Uh, they, 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 they move about and they think it's something that's been manufactured uh, and is not real in terms of their lived experience. Uh, so I'm hearing these three strains. Uh, where we come from as a church, we want to make certain that we get real-time information 
from subject matter experts. So I'm real blessed to be a part of the University of Maryland Medical Center, and I'm reaching out always to, to experts to get the real information. So we have distributed masks. Uh, we have uh, advocated for increased testing in West Baltimore. Uh, we have uh, also uh, advocated for uh, uh, people being certain about social distancing so that people do stay away from one another. Uh, so those are some of the things that we've been involved in and that we're doing. Reverend Hathaway, how do you get to that group of uh, people who say, I'm invulnerable, this will never affect me? How do you get their attention and get them to figure out that this is a dangerous virus? It's, 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 it's really, we got to go, and since we can't do it now, we really have to go to the old old megaphone, uh, where, where, you, where you actually go into the street, you speak from a megaphone, and you actually talk to people. Uh, you almost basically have to have open open air cars where you are talking directly to people, maintaining distancing, but going to where they are because they 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 feel as though one they've been underserved and they don't they don't real they don't feel as if this uh, disease is any different from anything that they're dealing with anyway. Uh, so if you think about West Baltimore, you know you think about we see health disparities, you see. Uh, the mortality rate uh, is uh, greater than other sections of the city. So people are always living with some kind of ailment or disease in the community. Right. So uh, Brom, when we, uh, Dr. Ward and I met just this week to figure out how we're gonna start our summer camp uh, for the students to come to UMB for the summer. This is something we started several years ago. You're really in close contact with the kids in the school level uh, and, and what they've gone through this spring and, and what's happening with them this summer and, and what do you think is going to happen in the fall? You know, well, first I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with both of you for um, the next hour. We're seeing, you know, it's interesting Reverend Al talks about these three groups, the way he groups them, and then the fourth group are really the kids, Reverend Al, and I know your heart is there because you have one of the first Head Start centers in the city of Baltimore when Union Baptist started, as you all know. So I would say that our kids have not been connecting um, in terms of school. You know, there has been an effort by Baltimore City Schools to give out Chromebooks first to graduating seniors so that they could finish up the year strong, but also to other children. Um, and so a number of our schools, the students, the families got Chromebooks, but even after they got the Chromebooks, they didn't know how to operate them and the parents weren't able to really help kids. So what I'm seeing is that more than 25% of children in the last, let's say 12 weeks that we've been home, have really been able to go online to access the information from their schools. Um, schools have not heard from these kids. And to be very candid with you, our staff have been doing a lot of check-ins. We use telephones, we call, and actually, to be honest with you, um, we're connecting with families to find out where these kids are, make sure that they're safe. We also try to check in to see like wellness checks. What do the families need? So we've been doing a lot of things, not just in our room, but also like with the hospital, as well as other UMB groups to provide food for people, making sure that they get information about resources in the community to really help keep them moving. Because one of the things, you know, we, we talked about in Bruce and, and Reverend Al, you know, as of right now, as we sit in our homes, you know, more than 40 million people have filed for unemployment in this country. And among black adults, fewer than half of black adults have jobs right now. So we are in the middle of, um, you know, we are losing or we have lost twice the number of jobs since the Great Recession. So I think that that's an issue that we're going to have to look at. And it's the relationship of that to children and families in our community, along with obviously this big pandemic, but also what's happening around social justice in our community and the demands that people are making around social justice. Yeah, thanks for that, Brown. And I know we've been checking in with our Cure Scholar 
the, the children and the families to make sure that they've got food, to make sure that their computer works, to make sure that they're getting uh, mentored, et cetera. That's an ongoing process. And I think we all worry about the summer because you sort of slide back in your academic performance if you're not going to some summer activity. So we've been trying to keep intensity up on that particular uh, topic. Uh, Reverend, you, you must have a lot of children in your parish who have summer programs. How are you trying to get at that issue? Uh, we have a program that's called Girls Who Code, and they, they, uh, they have basically been meeting virtually. Uh, and, uh, and because they are CODAs, they are two groups. One group is the uh, uh, third grade through eight, and then eight through 12. Uh, and so they've been doing activities. Uh, we have another aspect of what we do. We partner with uh, Micah, and we have a uh, an, a graduate intern there, and they're working with our young people around art. And so they they've also made that art uh, in church virtual as well. Uh, the uh, third ar area that uh, we are in, and and, and we're feeling good that uh, the uh, restrictions are being eased, is that we have a summer program in our Head Start program, uh, which the Promise Heights uh, uh, effort is uh, a big supporter of. And now we know now that we'll be able to be in place. I think now we just have to have, uh, I think they said 15 children to a classroom. Uh, that program usually takes in about 55 uh, children. So we have enough space in our building. We have a 30,000 square foot building. So we have enough space to be able to house those uh, young people that will be a part of that program. Uh, but those are the things that we've been doing there at Union. Ron, when it's been interesting over the years how successful Promise Heights has been, and particularly the Be More Babies program. So what's happened with Be More Babies since everybody's been shut in? How are you able to do that kind of program? Well, you know, that's interesting. Be More for Healthy Babies, we work with them um, along with the city health department to really help uh, pregnant women make sure we link them to resources, uh, using resource moms and dads, as well as provide the community with information about infant mortality prevention, safe sleep, um, and also information about resources. We, we have learned so much, Dr. Gerald, from the very beginning of this. Um, and the program is now known all across the country. We get phone calls all the time because we are really meeting the goal of um, diminishing or decreasing the infant mortality rate, so much so that in this little West Baltimore community of about 10,000 folks, our infant mortality rate is the exact same as Roland Park, which you all know is, is one of the most exclusive communities in Baltimore City. Um, but we gotta keep our Put on that pedal, though. We can't just say, oh, well, we've taken care of infant mortality, and therefore we are going to no longer have this problem, and then we're going to ease up, and then guess what? In five years, we'll be back to where we were. So we have been doing virtually these groups, um, groups where women come together, very interesting where we will come together to start talking. We have breastfeeding groups. We do virtually, believe it or not. <laughs> and we're helping women make sure they know how to breastfeed. And, and they talk about, oh, I'm having a problem or, or whatever it is that's going on. But the other thing is that what's interesting is that many of the conversations, after we start talking about whatever is the topic of the day, will will really move to either an issue like COVID or really mental health issues in the community. And I really want to get that on the table. Um, so we are really trying to attack mental health issues virtually. Um, we also have been, we have a real strong group of barbers that we've been working with in West Baltimore through Beemore Healthy Babies, informing them about safe sleep and all that. They are reporting that hair, men that are coming in to get haircuts or whatever, are really talking more about mental health issues and things like suicide, um, issues that really depression, anxiety, um, that, you know, people do talk to their beautician or whatever. So where we're going to go with that is we're going to be training barbers and beauticians 
about mental health issues and their resources and what you can do. But to the, the short answer to the question is that virtually we can get together, not only virtually, we're keeping up with folks. When they need diapers and other supplies, we drop it off at their homes. They tell us that, baby wipes, because none of that, you cannot, even if you get food stamps and all know food stamps has been increased, um, the problem is that diapers are very expensive. So we've been giving out diapers and baby wipes. We even give them to the Safe Streets folks, um, another organization in West Baltimore, so they can help us get it out safely to people in the community. Yeah, so the barbershop model was a great model, and we all uh, very, very well remember Eli Saunders, a cardiologist at the university who made a, a great uh, science out of that. That put Baltimore on the map in a really positive way. Yeah. So I'm glad to hear you've got a way to still do that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, our barbers have really been carrying the message, you know, so much so, um, really before COVID, right before COVID, they were welcoming, welcoming us in the barbershops, and we've had what's called cozy corners, where we've been supplying, supplying books for children there as they wait or they're maybe they're with their dad or um, a male figure or even a mom that's maybe getting a haircut. And they can have books that they can take with them. So that was one of the things that we've been working on is putting those in barbershops, but also laundromats, because people spend a lot of time in places like that. And um, it's a way to provide information. And I think it's a way eventually, as we start moving forward, we're gonna have to use these old fashioned ways of flyers, of, um, you know, uh, we, we, are, we do a great job on our campus of the flat screen TVs in our parking garages. We need to continue to do that and provide information um, even our churches, many of them have flat screen TV. Maybe what we need to do is also provide the churches with messages that they can insert in their flat screen TVs, you know, along, you know, with the health messages that we want to put out there. That might be something that we want to talk about with, you know, Reverend Hathaway and the other ministers that we work with so closely. Yeah, I, I've, I've been made aware uh, of the severe problem of mental health in, in the West Baltimore community. And I, I guess we need ways to address that in, in some better manner. Of course, we need that for the whole population, but yeah. particularly in West Baltimore. So Reverend Hathaway, I, I noticed that um, uh, uh, pictures of some of the churches in West Baltimore have all these antennas and microwave and all kinds of different things on top of them now. Uh, that I don't think were there a year or two ago. Uh, of course, at UMB, we were able to transition uh, to online learning and teleworking fairly quickly. What was that transition like for you, and, and how are you uh, maintaining close contact with your parishioners? You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I've been at Union Baptist since uh, now 2004, uh, but in 2007, we created what was probably one of the first in the country, a cyber center. Uh, we partnered with, uh, at that time, University of uh, Maryland General, the, uh, now University of Maryland Midtown. Uh, we had a, a technical advisor, uh, and we later became, uh, with Comcast, a internet learning center. <clears throat> so, so the idea of, of technology being embedded in ministry really has been a part of our uh, experience since 2007. Uh, so when we made the transition now, of course, to virtual services, uh, it was not a heavy lift because uh, we had worked with the University of Maryland and we had one of your uh, gerontology uh, teachers came and created what we call cyber seniors. So we had seniors that are members of our church who began to develop skills because they wanted to communicate with uh, their younger members of their families. And then, of course, we had our cyber uh, center program and our girls at code and our boys at build. So there is a, within our base of our membership, there is a wide acceptance of the use of technology. So when we made the shift to a virtual um, a ministry, uh, in fact, I, if I, I just say this as a footnote, if any of us known that Zoom would take on like this, we would all bought some stock. I mean, it has, it has, it has become uh, 
uh, a main in terms of connectivity in our community. Well, we were able to make that shift to a virtual service and we have continually to improve it so much so I'm not having any rush to come back in place. <laughs> they said they love being a bedside Baptist. And so, uh, <laughs> so, it's, so it's, it's, been a, uh, it's been a good experience for us. Yeah, well, I think that's a that's a great comment, and I think we're examining that at UMB too. You know, things work pretty well uh, in terms of working remotely. Now, that's not to say that I want to live the rest of my life that way. And there's a whole different kind of stress that comes from working remotely and being in video conferences all day. Uh, and you can see the stress in some of the people that you meet with. Uh, and it needs to be managed and it needs to be channeled in a proper way. But but uh, we made the transition as well. And it was it's been interesting. Uh, I just I just wonder what it's like uh, for things like mental health and counseling and people who have real needs and need that personal interaction. Will we get it to the same level as it is person face to face? I will say to you that I have been working uh, in creating what's <clears throat> known as the African American Neuroscience Research Initiative. So I've been swimming upstream to really understand what is the impact uh, to the brain of trauma. And, and if you have to think about this, this is a very traumatic experience. This experience, uh, the, uh, the death of Brother Floyd, is traumatic experiences. These are causing changes in the circuitry in our brains. And I believe that's important that research institutions like University of Maryland assist us in understanding that and studying that so that we can develop procedures and protocols and treatments to deal with this trauma that we are feeling and to deal with this the impact that it's having on our circuitry and our brains. Yeah, and, and, and I remember that the trauma that occurred after the Freddie Gray events uh, was in fact something that a lot of people were interested in understanding, particularly in young mothers uh, and, and the effect, the negative effect it had on their, their outlook on life. So those are real things and they are things that need to be studied. There's just no question about that. Uh, Alex, do we have any questions yet? Well, uh, we have a couple. Uh, I'm going to bring in, if I can, uh, Tyrone Roper, who you know from the Community Engagement Center, he has some things to say. Uh, Tyrone, are you there? Can I introduce Tyrone first? Oh, yeah, well, go, go ahead. Sure, sure. Uh, Tyrone, it's great to have you on this. Uh, Tyrone really uh, is in charge of our Community Engagement Center, soon to come online in the new building uh, in July. Uh, I know Tyrone has put, been putting in long hours, including the, the day of voting, uh, and has been mentoring a lot of students in the West Baltimore uh, community. So Tyrone, it's really wonderful to have you here. Uh, fire away at your question. <laughs> so wonderful. Can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. All right, super, super awesome. Hey, look, um, so I really don't have questions specifically. I just really wanted to um, continue to add upon all the great work that everybody's doing. And, and more importantly, really just highlighting the efforts of the Office of Community Engagement and the CEC team. Um, because one thing I can say about the University of Maryland, Baltimore, is we are involved in the community um, at a very granular level. Um, mm -hmm. So our PAL coordinator, Bourne McCraw, has been doing a sensational job at keeping the young kids interested in programming. So much of you may know that it's really difficult to keep kids involved when they're not in front of you. And it's even more of a challenge to try to keep them engaged when you have to do it virtually. Um, so Bourne's really been working hard to keep that going. Um, he's also been involved in some food distribution, um, getting food to the families of the kids we serve. Um, that is a space that I think that we all should continue to be attentive to. Um, so he's doing that and right now he's preparing for another distribution of food to the families as well. On top of that, um, uh, Lisa Rawlings, um, she continues to work like heck to ensure that we provide our virtual win, uh, workforce Wednesdays. So Lisa's doing a great job at keeping that going um, because we know that it, the axiom is folks need work. And, and she's really in that space ensuring that people can continue to engage and identify work opportunities. Um, and then lastly, I just really wanted to say that um, one of the things that we've spoken about, and I'm very sensitive to this, is we understand the 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 the, the truth is that a number of African Americans have uh, been impacted in a very negative way by COVID, um, and that they are really among some of the highest rates of those that have contracted and um, passed as a result of this virus. Um, so we'll be launching a campaign called I Care. Um, it's something very very innocuous, right? It's not intended to be this big stellar program. 
but it's a way to kind of motivate our community to be interested and committed to keeping themselves safe and healthy. Um, so what I cares is, is each week we'll identify two individuals that have an opportunity to mail in the photo of themselves practicing safety, wearing a good mask, doing a good deed. And then from there, we're simply going to identify two and issue a $25 gift card. I'm hoping that the word spreads. Um, again, it's a small token, right? It's not much, but the goal is to really get folks interested and, and really committed to keeping themselves safe in their communities and ensuring that they then become the champions and messengers of, of safe practices in their communities. Um, so that said, that's really all I had, but this is really good stuff. When, when, whenever we're talking about community, I think that it's important that, you know, we could really be tethered to the conversation because we're all in the same space working together. And um, it is great to see you, Dr. Broman, as well. So as always, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tyrone. That was wonderful. Uh, Alex, other questions? Well, we have a question, uh, an anonymous question. Someone's asking, uh, you know, what can students do? You know, what? How can students uh, participate? You know, we um, they've been limited in what they've been able to do in the field. And I know you have a lot of uh, of people, uh, of Bronwyn. Uh, but what what are things, or what or what can they look forward to doing to help out uh, when things open up more toward the fall? I'm so glad that you asked that question because I think that there are a lot of things that students do um, because we need their leadership but we also need their energy. Um, so one of the things that we really are working on, I think COVID and we've all mentioned it briefly, has really shown um, the digital divide of our communities. It's really, I mentioned that maybe 25% of our children were born online. Um, and part of it is because they don't have access or we are a family maybe and choosing a telephone for them to go online and they have three or four kids. Therefore, you know, they all can't go online at the same time. So we're working with a small group, including folks from UMB, their expertise, to help us figure out how can we erase the digital divide, in particular in West Baltimore. And we're looking to um, not asking for any funding from UMB, but what I need is their expertise to help us We've identified um, several buildings actually in the community where we're going to be mounting, and it has mounted, I know, um, and will mount probably on the community engagement center. But we have a couple of very tall buildings, believe it or not, and often do it right. So we're going to be mounting um, mesh antennas in that community, which will provide free internet access for the families that live there. Um, we have a trial, we're pretty sure we'll be able to go up for the paperwork is signed this summer to put the first one up to try. Because our concern is even though people are doing some great things with that and putting them up for like the libraries, um, being outside of the libraries so that people can use parking lots, well, less than one third of the residents in Upton Green Heights, number one, have cars. And number two, in that neighborhood, um, even though I'm there many days, many evenings in the dark, I don't think I would want to be in a car at eight o'clock in the evening with a computer trying to access information, even if I'm on a parking lot or on the street. I think that that's setting it up for some dangerous things. So we're looking at how can this, you know, be used directly in the home. We need students to help us with that. We need students that are, that are going to help get the word out, that are going to help us. Um, one of the things we're looking at is when people put that antenna up, and when I say people, it's not me, it's not Bruce, <laughs> it's not Reverend right now. We need trained people. That's part of what we want to do is train community members to know how to do that. But that might be something students want to do. Um, but we also need, I mentioned before, that even though school children are given Chromebooks, parents don't even know how to, you know, get them on, you know, um, turn on the Chromebook, let's say. Or like I have a surface and the surface, you know, little button is kind of hidden, you know, in terms of how you turn it on. So anyway, um, I think that people need information on how do you access this technology? How do you use it? How so? Who can we partner with? I'm not saying we got to reinvent the wheel on this, 
but I know that there are courses. We need people that can help us, um, you know, that can do that. People that are willing to go out with us and knock on the doors. We've been this summer providing information, early learning activities for kids with the you know, Prepper Library. They gave me, just for me writing an email, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I, I, I got a shout out to them as a great partner. 300 copies of brand new books. They hadn't even put these books in their system, but I wrote to them and said, I'm working with McCullough Homes. They have a couple thousand children that are living there and our libraries aren't open. What can we do to help me? Um, and we actually, working with the housing authority, went, door, went to the different homes that have children zero to six to deliver these early learning packets of bubbles and other things, but also materials to talk to parents about how you use the material. So again, we can use um, the students to help us with that. They can help us think about other ways in terms of, you know, how, like, like Reverend Al said, the bullhorn. I don't want to be on a bullhorn ride from the city. I don't think you do either, Bruce, or even Reverend Al. But somebody that knows the radio station to put on, you know, the music to get people to start. Oh, well, wait a minute, some, to go to the window so that they, uh, you know, hear the message or, or things like that. We need help with that. Um, you know, we need help just even thinking through what are some of these strategies that we can to help us move forward in terms of just feeding people and then like jobs of the future. Because I think the other thing that I really want to shout out the university is that we have to use our expertise to help us in ways that we haven't used in the past. I mean, they're talking about this, and I know I'm going on and on, but I got the soapbox right now. You're good, you're good, Brown. <laughs> they're talking about de-investing in the police. And that has a message for every, different messages for different people. But we need to help using our expertise of our law school, of our social work school. What does that mean? Can social workers better serve people that are having a mental health crisis than showing up the door with a police officer with a gun? A domestic violence, child abuse. Why do we have the police so involved in the first line of defense? These are things that we're trained as social workers to deal with. Substance abuse, homelessness, you know, the police even do wellness checks on people. That's to me outrageous. Um, I think there are a lot of things like that we could be doing, but we need the energy, the brain power of our young people that are coming in to help us think this through. And for us to give suggestions, I think, to the powers to be in City Hall, because as we now know, we have a, a young man as a mayor who's gonna to wanna to hear from the university about what um, can be done, not just in West Baltimore, but all, all over the city. That's why I always like having social workers on these face-to-face -face, uh, discussions. Not only do I hear a lot, but I learn a lot. So the great comments. Uh, Alex, how are we doing on our questions? Oh, we have some. You know, while you were talking, Brian, when uh, Tyrone uh, messaged me back, you, you, you talked about the people getting internet access. They have hired someone, the Community Engagement Center has hired someone, a staff person, to start putting uh, internet access towers. And I think they have one on this PEC building. And he said they can help people gain access to the internet. So that's a that's a connection to talk about. We, uh, you, um, you know what? We're working with him. <laughs> okay. He is, as a matter of fact, just so that you know, maybe I shouldn't say that, next week we're going out together um, in West Baltimore to um, one of the things is it's much easier, I was telling Reverend now, it's much easier if we know, um, you know, who owns the building. So the, the high rise is owned by the community builders. We've been working with them for over seven years on projects. So they're like, okay, when you wanna come and then put the antenna in our building, and we're like, oh my gosh, we can't, um, you know, we're like, wait a minute, we're not ready yet, you know, to put it on your building. The other thing is that we're working with a big internet company that's based in Baltimore near the university that really is going to eat the cost 
of all of this because they want to show the city of Baltimore what could be done if they join the effort. You know, um, they really want access to conduits, not just to the rooms of buildings. All right, Alex. All right, okay, I'll keep moving. Uh, Trisha O'Neill is out there in the audience. Uh, she, I think you answered part of one of her questions, but she's got more. Trisha, are you there? Absolutely. Hello, friends. Good afternoon. Uh, I will set aside the idea of um, reimagining police, but many of the things that you talked about, Brownwin, are essential to moving the neighborhood forward and creating those connections between UMB but I wonder if we ever share success stories um, in a way that, that acknowledges how the community is responding. It's not really to emphasize us doing good deeds, but more to show that interplay and to encourage participation and, and storytelling to our community, because that's important for creating hope. Uh, yeah. I think at this point in time, we're looking for more hope so if we could publicize some of those pieces, I think that would drive involvement um, and create some hope and connections at the same time. Yeah. I, you know, I, hi, Trisha, I really do agree with you. Um, you know, I, I'm gonna, I see this, the social justice issue of George Floyd, um, I don't know, maybe differently or whatever, but that was a response to the lack of hope when people went out and started burning down their community. That, that um, of course, it was very upsetting for someone like me to see. Um, believe it or not, um, I was alive during the 68 uprising and with, with my mother who wanted me to see it, it wasn't my neighborhood. We drove through it to see the aftermath. Um, and I remember um, buildings and I could smell the smoke. Um, and everything, and that didn't happen in Baltimore. But, but I always believe that women, when keep not women, when people take to the streets like that and they're burning and destroying, it's because their anger and rage, and they've been so disinvested and so ignored over the years. And I think that you're right. We don't a address it enough. We don't talk to people enough. And then when we do have good success stories, we don't know how to sell it. We don't know how to tell it. We don't need, we don't know how to really involve people in terms of helping us um, with the success and helping us to kind of figure it out. I don't figure this stuff out by myself. We've had a lot of failures, I hate to say, in Promise Heights, and I hope my program officer isn't listening. But um, we've had a lot of success. It takes time to really figure out kind of the middle ground of how you reach some of that success. Thank you. Alex? Well, we have a, um, a comment from our Facebook Live. I didn't mention this, I should have. This is being streamed on Facebook Live, by the way, too. Uh, so, so we, we get uh, comments or questions and we can relay some of those. So Lori Anderson Pollock writes, uh, yeah, it's something she heard uh, Reverend Hathaway talk about with uh, older parishioners, she says, Reverend, what, what other needs can we help with? How can we serve your older adult worshipers? I don't see. Uh-oh, we lost him. <laughs> we lost the Reverend. Where He just must have just dropped off. You know, let oh. me, I'm, um, uh, okay. I, I go to his church um, more than any other church I go to. So let me try to crack it. I'm sure I can't give you a great answer like him, but so many of our black churches have health ministries. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is making sure that we train, help work with them and have health ministries are interested, train health ministries in terms of what they can do. The isolation, the loneliness that um, Ms. Anderson Pollock speaks to, I think we have to be able to address. It's one that we can address with students also, I think, um, in terms of touching base. And right now, where we can't go out a lot, but people have phones many times, and we could call and check in and chat um, with them. They may not be able to figure out how to use Zoom, and have a Zoom 
um, cocktail hour with their friends or whatever, but just a voice on the other end of the phone to just check on them and say, I'm here, how are things going, what's going on, what are you doing, you know, do you need something? Those are things that I think our students can help with also um, and can help us with these, um, with the churches and the training. Um, because you're right, in many of our Black churches in particular, many of the folks that are going to church are more in the upper end of the ages than, let's say, the younger people. And so I think that is one reason why River Now was able to speak so forcefully uh, around the social isolation of older adults. So I would say one of the things is, is really working with health ministries to figure out, you know, that they understand what does it look like in terms of mental health issues? What is a person's really saying? What are the resources that are out there? You know, who can we connect this person with for um, some help? Thank you. Alex, did we find the Reverend or not? Uh, no, not yet. I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, well, let's let's keep rolling, but I hope you find him. He's an important part of this discussion. I know. I have a, a nursing student, Farnaz Morani. Uh, are you there? Do you have your, do you want to make a comment? Oh, maybe she's not there. Okay. Um, well, let me uh, get back to her comment. Um, Kind of hoping she'd make it herself. She was saying that they, uh, uh, she hopes the fall semester will be online, especially the uh, uh, medical related courses. Most of them are part time in treatment environments. Uh, she says the families need to be safe, uh, but they are missing. Uh, they are missing some contact with people. Uh, what 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 do you suppose we can do about that? And, you know, Brian. I is she talking about uh, students in the community or is she talking yeah, about students in the community? Uh -huh. I have a thought. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I may as well take the opportunity. I have a thought. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on, um, I got to give a big shout out to uh, Jane Schaub and Brian Sturdivant. Um, my dean of uh, Rick Bar asked me to join um, one of the, join the community engagement committee for UMB recovery. And Wendy Shire and I from the School of Social Work have been very involved and engaged with that committee. And one of the things that um, was brought up and I had hoped to say during this call um, and that we're gonna recommend to the president, um, is that we really need to think about establishing like a vaccine clinic um, because so many children are behind on their immunization um, because of COVID-19. Um, many parents are trying to decide, do I take a chance and take my child, you know, to see the pediatrician but there might be sick kids there, you know, and my child would get sick, just like any of us. Do we take the chance of going out because we got a cough and we think it's something? So we know that kids are very behind on um, vaccines. I did um, a number of years ago working with the health department. They were very kind and gave me vaccines um, and equipment, everything. Um, to offer vaccine clinics at schools. Um, and we were able to get doctors and nurses to volunteer from UMB that came up and they did the vaccines. These were vaccines particularly for kids that were going to be put out because they were behind on vaccines. You know, going in the set, there's some, been some new rules. If you go to sixth grade to seventh grade, you need some vaccines. Um, and then there were some other vaccines things that kids just didn't have going to school. I think we're going to find um, that again, that people are behind and the university could offer a space somewhere. You know, the university, our library, that's where I get my flu shot every year. Um, the library, with the school of pharmacy, I think they put it on, well, all UMB puts it on, but they have a system. If you haven't gone over there, you're in and out. Those students do the shots. 
um, you know, um, you get the paperwork. Um, it's great. I, I mean, I'm not even over there 15 minutes. I'm at the library. We have a big space there. Um, and across the street from the library is a parking lot. Why couldn't we make that available for people to be able to park there and run across the street with their kids and get that vaccine before school starts or whatever? Or at the community engagement center, which is going to, like, like uh, Bruce said, it's going to open in July. Wouldn't that be nice? At the grand opening of something, you know, I guess I know we're going to have a grand opening, that we could have a vaccine clinic along with the clown and all that other stuff. Um, and let parents know, um, you know, um, that type of thing. So I think we need to really think about that. Um, I want to say one thing that's going to be really odd and out of the whatever, but I want to bring it up because I have the opportunity. You know, our city's been talking about the kid, the squeegee kids. And I know probably people on my staff that are listening like, oh no, she's gone down the wrong place. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking about this. You know, we have all these fantastic garages with all of this, you know, it's all of us are in there. Um why can't, you know, we set up like in some of the high class garages. Where you and, and shopping malls, you leave your car and they wash your car for you. Um, you know, could we figure out something like that? And these squeegee kids wash the, I mean, I wouldn't mind if they wash my car. Um, and maybe that would get them off the street. Okay, I, I won't say anymore because I, I know that Rachel Donegan that works with me is by now on the floor and getting ready to take gas or whatever. But anyway, I just think we need to think so outside of the box to help our, our city and our neighbors because of, like I said, the economy when I started talking about all about that. So I see we got Reverend Hathaway back. Welcome, Reverend Hathaway back. Uh, Bronwyn, one thing on the vaccine, some of you may have seen a, an op-ed, uh, I believe it was in the Sun paper by Dr. Jim Campbell, uh, yeah. talking about how during the COVID crisis, families had not been bringing their children in for vaccinations. And of course, there's a downside to that. And it's a really big downside because many of these diseases have been cured or certainly managed very, very well with these vaccines. And, and uh, I think the evidence is pretty strong about safety, but more importantly, efficacy. Uh, and what one thing Bronwyn didn't mention is that we also are looking at what are the opportunities to bring some of our COVID vaccine trials uh, into the community, because I think personally that that would be a great benefit uh, once people get comfortable with what we're trying to do, uh, because all of us want to be protected from that virus right now. Absolutely. So, so Reverend, uh, welcome back. Uh, I don't know, you know, right when you were talking about we needed students to engage in the community, I don't know what happened. I just went into cyberspace, so I needed a <laughs> student to come bring me back. <laughs> well, I'm sure you were in heavenly cyberspace. You well, I, I, I will say to you that uh, I have been a participant in one of the long, longest ranging studies by NIH on the uh, study on aging, uh, which is uh, which is which is really nationally known. Uh, and they and, and one of the things that they did was they wanted to systematically make certain that they involved different ethnic groups in that study. That's the kind of study that when John Glenn went up to the uh, moon and we went up to the space, they studied him. And, and so I'm a part of that. So I feel like I'm a part of this big, broad network of people who at each stage of my uh, life cycle, uh, I go in and they they test me and they say, hey, you getting older. I say, well, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but uh, but I think I think we're going to have to break down barriers and resistance on the particular on the part of African-Americans to participating in clinical trials and studies. Uh, there is so much learned. Uh, there is uh, so much that one can contribute. Uh, I think we there are the uh, protections and safeguards in these trials now that some of what had been historic in, in terms of uh, our community being taken advantage of does not really exist now. Uh, and I think we've got to work real hard as a collective community to let people know that this is a way one that they can get care too, that they can participate in the furtherance of knowledge of how to better provide care. Right, and always be on our guard to make sure that these are being done properly. 
Yes. I think that's important. Alex, uh, we need a question for the Reverend. Sure. Well, you know, uh, Reverend, when you when you dropped out, right, right when someone was asking about, and we've had a lot of questions about uh, older people, particularly your older parishioners, what uh, what kinds of things do they need and what ways can people help to uh, take care of them? What, what kinds of things are you hearing? Yeah, a couple of things. One is that um, uh, they uh, they are isolated. So it's a simple thing, just a call, uh, just uh, introducing them to Zoom, uh, introducing them to how can we be connected? The other thing that, that happened, there's fearful. So one of the things that we set up, we have what we call a St. Luke's ministry that allows for a senior member of our church. If there is something that they need, where they need to go get a prescription or they need to go to the store, our younger members are able to go and perform that service for them and bring that a particular product or medicine to their homes. Uh, the other thing that they that they are fearful of is that the, the information that they're getting, as you know, from a national source has been disjointed. And so it becomes very important that uh, what you're doing here at University of Maryland in terms of informing persons like myself that may have some kind of influence, it's good that we give real-time information to our parishioners and senior members of our community. So these kinds of conversations are instructive and very helpful as we talk to members in my community and talk to So I know, uh, Alex, you may have other questions. I, I just, at this point, I want to make sure that, that uh, we get to George Floyd, even if it's briefly, uh, because I think that's such a critical uh, uh, topic right now. And I think my question for both of you is, w what are you feeling? What's, what's going on in the community? But, but then I need advice. I'm obviously white. I don't know all of the issues around this. I'm learning them. And I want UMB to be at the forefront of this. So how do we get to that position? Even though we've made some progress, I know and you know we got miles and miles to go. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that um, the uh, tragedy of seeing in effect what was uh, the actual asphyxiation, the actual lynching, I mean, just brought back uh, and just was a, took the scab off of the wound in the African-American community, how we are so vulnerable to people with authority and in power. Uh, and, and I think it was just so tragic because it was just so um, inhuman when people were giving, uh, you know, calls, hey, take it easy, let up, you know, you can't breathe, that you didn't get a response. It, it really highlighted uh, power and authority over against people who are vulnerable. And I think that's why you've seen across the country and across the world a response to this. I think in terms of uh, institutions like University of Maryland or Baltimore, it becomes important that you, one, I think you evaluate your systems to ensure that your systems are equitable and are diverse. And I think that that self-analysis is very important during this time. Uh, the second thing I think is important is that your, your, your intellectual capital should be used to help us in the community to do, conduct that same kind of evaluation. Uh, how do we evaluate systems within our community? Are they equitable? Are they fair? I think I think the one thing that I, that I would say is that you have in your sphere of influence, so many people, so many personalities, so many talents, so many skills. It's important that you think strategically, how do we integrate that kind of brain power and intellectual capital into the life cycle of, our, of your neighboring community? I think we do those things. Uh, I think we'll find that one, when we have to need information around uh, the data, you can provide us the data. We can speak intelligently about matters. I think the other thing is, is that we have the institutional capacity of University of Maryland and its various departments to back us up so that we're not out there alone. Great comments. Bronwyn? I agree. I really agree wholeheartedly. Um, one of the things that I've seen, I've been on this campus for over 15 years. And I always felt that when I first arrived that we had so much to offer, um, yet we were just sitting on a piece of land or whatever it was. 
Um, and I am so thankful to um, President Kerman, Chancellor Kerman, and what he did <laughs> to open it, to open us up to the community. Um, and it exposed warts, you know, it exposed our warts. But we also, I think, received this very genuine and wanting to learn what could we do to learn and to give back. And so I really appreciate that he has planted the seed to let us bloom so many ideas and to try so many things. The beauty of being an urban um, university in a city such as this, so that I think we are really poised to look at social justice issues, as I was alluding to earlier, in terms of de what I'm going to call is re de investing in the police and reinvesting in community resources and nonprofits that can really be the ones that can help the community heal. That when you have domestic violence, when you have child abuse, that you're sending in people that are very helpful and can really provide some services and not the police that really are just there to make sure that nobody hurts anybody which you know there is a clear role for that i'm not saying and i'm not one that's saying remove the police from the community because we certainly need them but we can do things in other ways we can use mediation you know between neighbors that are arguing about stuff we don't need to call the police all the time, but we need to have, but we need to be, people to be trained in that. And who better than the university can help train in terms of that? Because we have people in our law school, in our social work school, and other schools that are trained mediators. So I think that there are a lot of roles that we can play in terms of helping our community move forward from um, an issue like George Ford. We also, working with our students to make sure when they come in um, that we ground them that we give them not just the opportunities they're going to be the ones that are going to go out in the community they're going to work with people that look like me and never now um you know so that they know how to talk and work with us in such a way that's culturally appropriate um and so that we, you know we really give them that but we also need to ground them in the history of Baltimore. We have a, a rich history, um, and I'm more than willing to work with Reverend Al and you to help us to do that a bit more. Yeah, and I think that's exactly right. And we got that suggestion mm -hmm. uh, last week, and we are going to act on that. We just got to figure out how we're going to do it and how quickly. But but that's something we're do we're definitely going to do. Alex, we may have time for one more question. Well, we're going to let Trisha O'Neill double dip here because she has a good, she has a, a problem, I think what you'll think is a good idea on this topic that we're talking about. Trisha, go ahead. I think it, it might be helpful if we put together a master online course um, available not just to our community, but to the rest of the community, particularly you and me, Bruce, all the white folks, um, on being anti racist. Um, <laughs> are not trying. I see you smile, if you're ever. Uh, <laughs> because w we need to create um, opportunities for people to reach for what they want um, when they don't know how to get there yet. Yeah. Um, as you said, President Gerald, there's a lot of people who want to do better but don't feel equipped. And it's not really the responsibility of the black and brown community to tell us how to behave. It's our responsibility to reach for that information. And I think the university is in a good place um, to help broadcast it to the community. Well, I'll have further conversations with you on that, Tricia. Could I just say one thing? Uh, when we had the incident of uh, Freddie Gray, uh, the uh, law school, uh, developed a program did. of which uh, you had a very diverse aspect of the community participate in, which was, I thought, uh, the, the real proper use of the uh, college and its resources. We may want to look at this in terms of, uh, of what we find now with uh, Brother Floyd and, and other victims of violence, how we can change, because people now addressing the issue. I, I say this one more thing. I had a gentleman who was a venture capitalist. He had a all uh, white uh, uh, partners. 
until he until we talked to him, he didn't really understand or realize that he wasn't being inclusive. Uh, he had a foundation, he was providing funds, he was doing other great things, but in terms of his decision making, in terms of his wealth building, he really didn't realize that he didn't he was not inclusive. Uh, in terms of his organization, and that has changed. And the amazing thing, he tells me, he said, man, you recommended a person that I had a business that was $20 million, and that person tripled that business to now it's worth over $60 million. That's the value of diversity, among other things. That's a, I, uh, that, that's my mistake in not getting a, 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 a rep <laughs> fee or something. <laughs> yeah, stock. Well, I think we're we're out of time. First of all, for, for Bronwyn and, and Reverend Hathaway, thank you for giving us your time here. It was extremely useful. This won't be the last. This will be the first, and I'm sure we will talk more about this uh, as soon as we all get out of quarantine, huh? Yeah. I'm looking forward to. So, so thank you very, very much. Uh, Alex, any other announcements? We have face-to-face um, uh, -face next week. We have a special edition on Monday with uh, Dr. Robert Gallo and Dr. Scheiman caught a little about uh, a new uh, uh, proposal that could be very uh, useful in the fight against COVID-19. So that is, uh, that's going to be uh, something to watch. That's Monday at two o'clock. That's gotcha. great. I look forward to seeing you all at that. So with that, I want to thank you all. Thank you again to our participants and thanks for all of you who signed on as an attendant. So thank you and until next time. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.